Greetings and welcome to the first episode of what hopefully will be a series of videos where we attempt to do simple yet challenging missions in Kerbal Space Program. We will together go over the theories of how and why, where we then attempt to apply the science necessary in hopes of achieving our goals. We will explore and hopefully learn together through trial and error, ma mainly error, and attempt to gather the science necessary to further our space program's reach into the cosmic void. So, with no further ado, let's get started. In today's playthrough, our goal will be attempting to get into orbit and gather the research we can on the way there. So, just some quick theory as to why we will do what we do. How do we plan on achieving orbit, you ask? Excellent question, I say. You see, we have mainly two forces to overcome, gravity and air resistance. We'll start with gravity. Well, Gravity. What is gravity? Gravity, per definition, is the mutual attraction between all masses in the universe, meaning that you too, in an essence, are attractive. We start our journey in the Kerbal Space Center and go immediately to the Vehicle Assembly Building. From the Vehicle Assembly Building, we construct a rudimentary rocket. We haven't unlocked anything yet, so we don't have much, but we make two. Our rocket will consist of one solid rocket booster, two fins, because fins are cool, and four science experiments to gather some science points. And of course, also a parachute, since we would like to retrieve the data and also, of course, our astronaut. For the first missions, we'll be focusing on going as high as possible. We launch this rocket, and as it goes up, we attempt to gather the science at the various altitudes. We manage to conduct all four experiments and come hurtling back to the planet after having reached a height of only 8,700 meters. We then recover the craft and all its science, which we'll be using to unlock other components to help us progress through this game. The more important items we obtained were a liquid fuel tank and a matching engine for it, meaning we now have a liquid fuel engine which we can control the throttle of. A decoupler, which means we now can build stages for the rockets that can be discarded during flight. This is very important. And finally, to complement this new setup, we have unlocked a new larger solid rocket fuel booster. These should come in handy. We then add some more cool looking fins. And finally, we have one new science experiment, namely a thermometer, meaning we now can measure temperatures. Lovely! For our launch, we now use our new boosters to brute force us through Kerbin's atmosphere, collecting science higher than we previously did. Soon, some noticeable wobble occurs and we experience a staging error. We forgot to stage properly the rocket and decouple too early. Remember kids, always check your staging beforehand. Oh well, we make the best of it and attempt to collect more science. And once again, we come hurtling back down after having this time reached an altitude of 19,000 meters. We recover the spacecraft, giving us a solid 34 science. We use our new science to purchase survivability, giving us another science experiment in the form of a barometer to measure surrounding pressure. The more experiments we have at our disposal, the more science we can gather. And of course, we also get heat shields now, which are very good to have too. Now that we have fixed our staging, we're ready for launch. The point of this launch is to measure the atmospheric pressures, and also to show that achieving orbit is much more than just going up. We see that we are passing the low carbon orbit, which is around the 70 km mark and upward. Yet, we eventually fall down again. But why aren't we orbiting even though we've reached the altitude needed? Gravity is one of four fundamental forces of our universe, and surprisingly, the weakest one at that. The three others being the electromagnetic, strong nuclear interaction, and weak nuclear interaction. But these aren't important to us in this video. So what's the problem here? Well, to get into orbit we have to go up, but a planet's gravity wants to pull us back down. Which normally is great in our day-to-day -day lives, but in this instance it's just a pain in the ass. How do we overcome it? Well, we exert more force than that of the gravitational pull. And how? With rockets. But it isn't all just going up, because if we shoot straight up, we come hurtling down, because again, gravity. But there is quite literally a way around that. You see, with the cannonball thought experiment, if you shoot a cannonball out of a cannon, it goes flying through the air, but falls to the ground shortly after. If we do it again, but add more energy, it goes farther. But what if we added even more energy? Well, instead of falling down to the ground, it remains in a stable orbit. But why? Well, the cannonball is not out of the planet's gravitational pull. 
Instead, it's just continuously falling towards the planet and only missing every time because of the extra kick of speed we gave it. You can see here that the direction of our vector, or velocity, is perpendicular to that of the planet's gravitational pull, meaning that we don't fly too far away and we don't fall into the planet. This means that during launch, we'll have to tilt our rocket a little bit to the side, preferably eastward, and that way achieve an orbit. We recover our spacecraft and collect our signs. We proceed to unlock some new components so we can finally build this rocket. But before we do that, what did the data about air pressure tell us? Air resistance. Air resistance is... Oh, wait, hang on, zoom back in. If we look at this chart, on the x-axis we have the air density, and on the y-axis we have the altitude. The exponential line we see is the change of air density to altitude. This shows us that the air density goes down the higher we go. But why? If we say the blue area represents the atmosphere at sea level, we can see that it has the rest of the atmosphere above. So the area marked in blue has the mass of the area marked in red above it that is constantly weighing down and compressing the atmosphere below it. So with more atmosphere weighing down and compressing, the higher the atmospheric density. Compared to the higher altitudes, where there is less atmosphere above weighing down and compressing, meaning we have less air resistance or friction to slow us down. Oh, would you look at that. The sun is setting. Great, so now we know that our rocket needs to turn during its trajectory up, and that we best initiate the tilt where the atmosphere experiences its greatest change in density, which is between the 10 and 15 kilometer mark. All right, great, now we can build our rocket. Well, there's still a little more to know. You see, as we're building our stages, we see these numbers showing up here. Now, I know they may look a little scary, but trust me, they will be your best friend during this journey. But what are they? Well, my friend, that is your delta V for the given stages. One term you will hear often is delta V. To understand delta V, imagine you're in a spacecraft and you activate your engines at point A and keep them running until you reach point B. Within that span of time and distance, your spacecraft either increased or decreased its velocity. Your delta V is therefore the number of how much of an increase or decrease in meters per second. Delta V, or our change in velocity, is needed to know whether our spacecraft can achieve orbit or not. For a Kerbal Space Program, we need to change our velocity by around 2000 to 3400 meters per second for a low Kerbin orbit, which would put us just above the 70 kilometer mark. Delta V is also used to calculate the change in velocity needed to reach celestial bodies such as Kerbin's natural satellite or moon known as the Mun, where we would need to increase our delta V with around 860 meters per second and then decrease it with an extra 280 meters per second so we don't fly by but instead orbit the moon. You see, we can use the delta V information to calculate if our rocket has the energy required to complete the maneuvers necessary to our missions. Before we summarize the video here, I would like to quickly get into the two apses most important to us at the moment. Let's just go from a circular orbit to a more elliptical orbit to easier visualize this. As we see here, the periapses is the shortest distance between the orbiting satellite and the object's center of mass of which it orbits. Whereas the apoapsis is the farthest distance of the satellite's orbit, and that pretty much sums up all we need to know for now. In the top left corner we have the rocket's altitude and related air pressure, and on the bottom we have the trajectory. As we lift off, we initiate a small tilt due east until we reach around the 10 km mark, and initiate a 45 degree tilt. We hold it, and begin to follow our apoapsis once it reaches an altitude of 70 km, initiating burns every time we're close to reaching the top of our trajectory. We do this until our periapses, or lowest part of our orbit, reaches an altitude of around 70 kilometers or more, thus achieving orbit. We can see that our total delta V is 3444 meters per second. Note that this number is at sea level. Once we enter a vacuum, it will increase. And we need around 3400 meters per second of delta V to achieve orbit. And since most of the spacecraft will operate in a vacuum, we will be more than fine delta V wise. Alright, I believe that we now are ready. We ignite our solar rocket boosters and immediately take to the skies. The boosters doing what they do best, boosting us upwards. Interestingly, when we hit the 4000 meter mark, our spacecraft starts to spin, making it hard for us to control. It starts banking westward, opposite of what we wanted. 
Now, I could have just continued and changed the orbit from an east to westward one, and I decided against that, and tilted back east to continue with the intended route. After adjusting course, we check to see that our apoapsis, so the highest point of our orbit, is now at the 70 km mark. We can now focus on the periapsis and on increasing its value. So what we're doing is we're increasing the altitude of the lowest point of our trajectory, so it matches up with the highest point of our trajectory, thus creating an orbit. We do this by increasing our velocity before reaching the top of our orbit, so the apoapsis, naturally increasing the periapsis. So we increase velocity until we match the required velocity needed to achieve an orbit. We do this incrementally until our periapsis begins an exponential climb, where we attempt to stop it at around the 70 km mark. And would you look at that? We are now in orbit. After pushing through the clutches of Kerbin, we complete our first step in our journey closer to the stars, and we are greeted by a familiar but yet alien solar system called the Kerbal System. This system comprises of 7 planets and 9 moons, giving us a total of 16 celestial bodies to explore. Back to the mission! We now do a retrograde burn, meaning we burn in the opposite direction of our heading to slow ourselves down, hoping to re-enter and land successfully. We proceed to decouple our stage and assume the landing position. Our spacecraft enters the atmosphere at around 2400 meters per second. And dare I say, things get a little heated. But fear not, for it all survives and we collect our astronaut and science. The mission wasn't the smoothest, but we accounted for the extra delta V exactly for situations like this. I hope this video helps out. Also, if there are any inaccuracies, please feel free to share in the comments. As for the next leg of our journey, we'll be looking to Kerbin's nearest moon, the Mun, and attempting a mission of landing a Kerbinaut on its surface. Stay tuned.